a little bit, take a little slower approach to talking through some of the points today. Um, my pitch is entitled The Journey to Enterprise Pass. And a lot of what I want to talk about today is that those patterns that companies have been using to disrupt in a pure play method, pure play software, uh, web services companies, are now becoming important to the enterprise. And all of my conversations this week have, week have really echoed that. Uh, there hasn't been a, a CIO meeting I've had this week where they've said, hey, this software and big data thing, it's not affecting me. I don't have to change anything I'm doing. Uh, so I'd like to talk through a little bit of our observations of how those companies have been competitive and how they are being disruptive, um, and how Cloud Foundry and this Platforms of Service initiative we've done at this new company called Pivotal is really aimed at bringing those patterns to the enterprise in a very consumable, enterprise-ready way. So uh, the high-level you know, concern is exactly what Eric mentioned, is software is really eating the world. And I think the great privilege of working at a startup funded by someone like EMC is that we don't have a legacy to protect. So we're able to go after the most important trends that we see out in the market. And when we took a step back in planning Pivotal, uh, we noticed that there are two big disruptions were happening, is that agility and rapid software delivery were really affecting the way enterprises delivered applications. And scale out and large scale big data was affecting the way that they thought about their business and reasons about change. But this pattern has been happening in smaller companies too. And as a didactic exercise, I like to take a look at little companies and what they learned in order to build so much value so rapidly in this last five years that we might call the cloud era. And you know, has anyone heard of uh, Y Combinator and uh, Paul Graham up here? A few people have, yeah. And he's more famous in Silicon Valley. And when he first came out, I really kind of wrote him off because his thesis was, why don't I take four engineers, maybe six, just give them a couple months in the valley, a small amount of money to just live on ramen, and, and coach them and see what kind of companies could come out of it. And I thought, man, this is hubris on Paul's part. He really thinks he can turn these people into rock stars, and they don't have a chance against the big incumbents. Well, what you can see is that I was wrong, and he's built companies that are now worth over $10 billion. Dropbox alone, which came out of Y Combinator, is worth $10 billion alone, and this number's a little bit outdated. The key thing that I learned from observing these companies now is not just cloud or not just startup, but Paul really taught them how to iterate rapidly. And if you take a look at his um, uh, blogs and uh, seminars that he holds, he teaches the teams to measure their growth every week. And this is the most important thing I've learned from some of these startups is the clock speed that they work at. And Paul said exponential growth really looks like 2% growth a week. It doesn't look like every nine months you have a giant step function. It looks like continuous improvement that allows you to constantly revamp your offering and constantly change. It's that ability to constantly change that I think has become so disruptive in the modern software economy because enterprises were really built to move at a different clock speed and I'll get into that. But the thing that has made this a, a relevant conversation in almost every CIO meeting or CTO or app enterprise architect meeting that I take is that it's become you know, obvious that many different industries are changing. Um, and, and the billions and billions of dollars are being created in value. Even if you look at something like Tesla, which at first sounds like a revolution in just an electric car, it's a wireless car. It's connected to a 4G network. And when there's a problem with the car, they update it online. And so a lot of the difference of the Tesla experience and what's been so disruptive is that there's no longer the same dealer relationship. You don't take it in to be serviced. It updates itself over a network. It's a software. It's a rolling laptop is really what it is. Um, of course, I'll talk a little bit about Netflix and some of the things that you can learn from them. But I'm also going to talk about Nest because Nest really represents a modern disruptive pattern. And I had the fortunate to be with uh, one of the leaders of Siemens the day that Nest was acquired for $3 billion. And he said to me, you know, if you can disrupt this boring little industrial device like a thermostat with a user experience and big data, what can't you disrupt? You know, they're coming for me. And so we're working with Honeywell on Pivotal CF and uh, Cloud Foundry is a competitor to Nest. Um, and we've had a lot of interest from industrial companies in this next generation platforms of service offering. The other way to look at this, in addition to the rapid growth of those companies, are how are traditional companies in IT growing? And this was put up by John Chambers uh, when he did the keynote at Cisco, um, their last event. And if you notice what happens here in 2011, as cloud starts becoming more mainstream, the rapid halt of growth of the traditional vendors suddenly kicks in. 
And John got up and he predicted that only maybe three of these five will be ready and alive in five years. And so talking with you know, a leader at a company yesterday, I turned to him and I said, hey, are you betting on just these companies to get your growth? Is that what you're betting on, people that can't grow themselves? And so the inverse is that while those other companies have been growing so rapidly and building billions of dollars of value, the year-over-year -year growth of the traditional companies has slowed. So something really profound is happening in our industry. And you know, it's, it's not no longer controversial to get up and say that software is disrupting a lot of traditional enterprises. Um, IBM has said that they did a study that enterprises that rely on software for compatibility or competitiveness are 70% more profitable. Warner Music was an early adopter of Cloud Foundry. We'll talk about them a little bit. And they said, hey, look, we've got to become a software vendor in order to compete in the modern world of Spotify and all these other things that are happening. Uh, and and in, even as, as traditional of an um, industry as banking that has a lot of entrenched uh, positional advantages, uh, BBVA has said, look, if we're not becoming relevant to our modern banking customers, then we're going to become, we're gonna, it's a matter of survival for us. There's a study of millennials that found that they no longer value their bank brands. They value them about one-tenth as much as the previous generation. And the reason is that everyone they interact with to buy things is largely like Amazon, their iPhone, iTunes, et cetera. Those are their major brands. Their bank, like who is that? Well, they don't even know that much about them. Um, and they don't put a lot of value on them as a brand. So what we've done as part of building an architect in Cloud Foundry is to really exhume a lot of the anthropology and the cultural behaviors behind these modern uh, hyper-competitive uh, software companies. And this is what we found. We found that it all begins with this agile process. That ability to iterate and rapidly change what you do gives you competitive advantage. If you can't change what you're doing, then you might have made the wrong bet. And no one's really smart enough to know eight months or a year in advance what the offering should be and get it perfect on the first pitch. There's always a fine-tuning process. Just like if you've ever been landing in the wind at an airport, the pilot's kind of constantly changing as he comes down. That's the same thing that competitive companies do today with software. Uh, they also really focus on horizontal scalability. So in the old world, everything that was written for Java was written for Big Iron, very stateful Java EE. Uh, that was that scale up model. Things have really changed to be a horizontal scale out model. That's how people are um, adapting to both availability as well as scalability. That's the modern paradigm. And finally, I'd mention, and I'll get into a little bit more into all of these later, that they do wrap a deep user analytic big data approach around all of this. Is that how do you know what to do in that next week's iteration? How do you know how to change your offering if you're not deriving deep insights from an aggregation and collection of the data that interfaces with your application? So some people forget that Netflix actually didn't start off as an online business of you know, content delivery. They were actually a pretty boring business that shipped DVDs to you. And their original data center was built on IBM P-Series and uh, VMware and just a traditional stack. And they actually pivoted to an IaaS approach as they built their online business. And a friend of mine, Adrian Cocroft, led that IaaS transition. But what he found was that this was better to have an infrastructure service approach, but it wasn't as good as their final destination, which was to transfer to a platform as a service approach. And here you took out those intermediate steps of QA and testing and operations deployment that slowed down that iteration cycle. And this is where he ended up when he gave a talk, um, now that he's a VC at Battery, about their final model for how they worked as Netflix, was using platforms of service. And I'll get a little bit more into that in the talk. But here's what actually the reality on the ground is is that while these hyper-competitive new companies have adopted new models of rapid iteration, horizontal scalability, and big data approaches, a lot of traditional enterprises still have these stovepipes. So you might have to talk to one person around network configuration, another person around provisioning of storage, another person about provisioning the middleware. And that whole cycle can take you know, much, much longer than a week or a month. And so this is where I'm meeting enterprises today, is they all look like this. And I call this my giggle slide, because usually I lead in with all these great things are going on, then I put up this and they go, oh, that's us, we're worse. So platforms of service helps that by codifying a lot of the things in the same way the infrastructure as a service made provisioning of storage and, and server hardware um, an API call. We can now take that same approach and make middleware data services um, an application dial tone, as we call to it, an API call. And I'll get a little bit more into that, but it's that same simplification that happened with infrastructure as a service, where you started trading off having all the options in the world for just the right amount of things faster. That same thing happens with platforms as a service. 
This is a little bit of a preview of you know, Cloud Foundry and our pivotal CF, uh, what you ultimately get. And I call this application dial tone. And this is the interface that you ultimately have as a developer when you use it. And the thing that you'll see here is if you've ever logged into Amazon and just used an infrastructure service, you might see hundreds of virtual machines all stacked up, right? And you're like, okay, now what's on these virtual machines and how are they related to each other? And where are the applications in this? And oh, if I delete this one, what does that mean? Um, and in a platform as a service approach, what you see instead are just applications, the domains and URLs that they're bound to, and the scale that you want to run them at. And that simplification really helps your development teams move much faster and think more clearly about what they have running on that infrastructure. This is the approach that we recommend enterprises take if they want to do disruptive things with software today and if they want to empower developer agility. The good news is for me and for Pivotal is that it's not just us and Pivotal who feels this way. Uh, the industry is really rallied around Cloud Foundry, which is an open source project, as the industry standard. And we've now, uh, under the pressure of all these people who wanted to become involved, formed a foundation. And what you'll see here is it's not made up of a bunch of you know, upstart web companies. It's actually made up of the who's who of the, of the tech 100. Um, from anywhere from SAP saying that we're going to be their new standardized platform as a service to IBM, who I have a slide in here, making a billion dollar bet on Cloud Foundry. These companies are feeling all of the pressure that I've described and they want to adapt and change together with us. And as a cohesive open source community, we really think we can, we can change the way enterprises do IT. You'll even see Bank of New York up here, who'll be speaking at the Cloud Foundry Summit next week, one of the more conservative financial institutions in New York, and had the fortune of having one of those CIO discussions where he said, you know, you're right, I do need to change. I want to join the Cloud Foundry Foundation and drive this tops down through my organization. I want to contribute. So this is really starting to affect enterprise IT. One of the smarter guys at Cisco is the CTO of their collaboration group. They use Cloud Foundry and they'll be talking next week at the summit about how the next generation of WebEx is built using platforms of service in Cloud Foundry. Uh, so not to steal his thunder a little bit, but this, you know, don't tell. Uh, so that's coming next week. And he wrote a blog where he talked about the operating system for the cloud is really this platform as a service layer because it combines what developers need with data services and operational needs and it has an open source ecosystem around it that all can participate in. So he kicked that off and he'll be talking a little bit more about how Cisco is using platforms of service. And Warner Music was the keynote of our last conference in the fall and there's a great video done by uh, their CTO where he outlined using this software factory approach changed how long it took them to deliver an application the first time they tried it with 10 developers from six months to six weeks. It's those kind of changes that have really caught the attention of both business leaders and application development leaders and CIOs in terms of how do they orchestrate themselves. Uh, IBM has said that this is one of the most seminal changes that has happened since Java in the enterprise. And they've come out and said, we're gonna bet a billion dollars on a project called Bluemix, which is Cloud Foundry as a service on SoftLayer. So we've got a big backing from them. And the net net is that IDC concluded that the idea of infrastructure as a service without platform as a service is really a dying breed. That infrastructure as a service doesn't go far enough in order to enabling your development teams and providing that application and data services dial tone that they need. But I want to take a step back for a second and look a little bit bigger picture. What's really happening to applications today? Um, it's not just that you're doing the same old thing faster. Applications and the way people are thinking about competing with software is fundamentally different today. And I think that's where uh, Cap has talked about the change is kind of in the air. And this is a, you know, a slide from IDC that talks about the nature of that change. And they've talked about this third platform. And that applications built for mobile, for big data, for cloud, have a different composition that they had in the past. And they've also isolated, and I think you can see that before in the vendor growth rates, that the fastest growth rates are in that third platform area. And that's what Pivotal as a company is really focused on. We're EMC's third platform company. Um, and that's what we're going after. So what's the largest acquisition in Google history? You've heard of some big acquisitions from Google. People know what it is, it's Nest. Um, and it was $3.2 billion. So why did they bet that amount of money on a brand new company that was just starting to enter the market? I think it's because Nest followed really the quintessential disruptive application pattern of our times. 
and that is that they combined this really great user experience that had mobile and highly personalized, hey, here's what your thermostat is, here's the temperatures, here's the setting. They personalized to someone, they gave a great experience. They rapidly iterated and they, and they really found market fit with the users. But they also then collected all the data from all of the nests in the world to start to tell utility providers how they should predict and how they should operate their, their utilities and the power plants that they have. And that is a really wicked thing because you've changed both the supplier experience from the utility side as well as the user experience. And this kind of pattern where you have a great user experience combined with large big data analytics that can change the supplier experience is the thing that gets business leaders so excited. And these kind of applications have a new pattern and Cloud Foundry was really built to use them. Uh, Netflix has talked a lot about how they did their transformation um, and how they thought about building new applications. And of course, they focused on speed and the market wins. Um, they also talked a lot about this new thing called microservices, which most people haven't heard of yet. But it's a way of deconstructing applications even more than just this services-oriented architecture. It's saying not, not only should every application have an API, but an application should really be an aggregate of multiple APIs working together as opposed to monoliths. And that pattern is really most effectively run on a platform as a service. It's almost impossible to run effectively without it. So this is a big change. And for people that are not in the application space, this is one of the, the things that I can talk about. I talked to the CIO of a company called uh, American First, and they're a kind of standard uh, insurance business for titles. So you wouldn't think that this kind of conversation would be an immediate you know, fire starter with them. But this conversation around monolithic versus microservices applications was really important to him. And the reason was is that it's hard to iterate and change on monolithic applications. So the whole team structure that you use, you do like a once every six month or once every nine month release. And it's harder then for each individual team to iterate. By decomposing things, you're able to have a team work in each microservice. And that is a cultural change in the enterprise. And even the CIOs of Bank of America and I have had this conversation, they're like, we're spending $7 billion a year right now. Chad looked up with one of the biggest customers of EMC. Uh, <laughs> we're spending $7 billion a year right now on IT. How do we get features through that spending faster? And how do we decompose our teams? And this is what's really important is it's both a technological and cultural change that's happening in the enterprise right now. And they're saying, how could we organize our technology teams around doing more decomposed services and applications so we can deliver features faster? That's the conversation that's really important to them right now. Um, and so pay attention to this idea of the changing nature of applications from monolith to more agilely composed, agilely composed apps. One of the problems for the industry has been that until now, the first supplier of this pattern, the best place to run some of that has been Amazon. And that hasn't left a diversity. It's built sort of a weird monoculture where the answer is Amazon to a lot of people when they're doing their things. Um, and we've seen that in this slide, how it hasn't, others haven't participated. Cloud Foundry is the first time, I believe, that there's really choice of how you take this next generation application architecture and deliver it in the enterprise on any cloud so that you're not just stuck with Amazon services. You can have that same full suite from the Elastic Runtime up here, which enables developer agility and microservices architecture, to scale out key value stores for doing rapid data ingest, to Hadoop as a service, Elastic Hadoop for wrapping analytics around it, Jenkins as a service for CI builds, Redis for caching that often happens in that microservices architecture. And the great thing is, is you can take this architecture to the cloud of your choice. So I don't know if folks noticed when Amazon dropped prices by 45%. Do people know why they did that? Does anyone remember why? Google announced the day before that their prices were 50% lower than Amazon's. And so there is a war happening now between Google and Amazon. And by using and leveraging something like Cloud Foundry, you don't have to choose a priori who's going to be the winner. You can use uh, private data center and converged infrastructure. You can use Google Compute Engine. You can use Amazon. You really have your choice. and You can take that consistent architecture everywhere you go. So this has you know, made us popular in our first couple months of general availability um, as a company offering Cloud Foundry since about January of this year. And you may have saw last year that GE invested $105 million into Pivotal. And a lot of people ask me, hey, why did they do that? So think back to that disruptive application pattern that I talked about with Nest, where you combine user experiences and next generation analytics. 
um, to disrupt things. GE has 16 industrial businesses that it knows have to undergo that transformation. And so by partnering with Pivotal to make Cloud Foundry and Pivotal Hadoop their standards for that architecture, they're working with us to bring that change to the, one of the most conservative enterprise companies in America. I don't want to steal the thunder of a lot of the companies that are coming to present um, at our conference next week in San Francisco. So it's a quick call to action, so probably a bit too late, but if you're happy to be in San Francisco next week, we're doing the Cloud Foundry Summit. And these companies, all enterprises, will be presenting about Pivotal CF, our enterprise offering, and how they're using it. I think the thing that I'll mention here is that, remember, we've only been for sale for about five months. So even after five months, we already have all of these enterprises and others coming to present about how excited they are about this architectural shift and how they're using it. And thinking back to that Nest pattern, you have a company in Philips that does a dispersed set of medical devices. And today, all those medical devices just sort of exist. So your grandmother might have a heart monitor, as mine does, a heart monitor from Philips. Uh, a younger person in your family might have one of their you know, um, more consumer-oriented workout monitors. And they've got this whole array of medical devices which all generate data, and they want to bring a user experience to them. And they turn to Pivotal CF and Cloud Foundry, and they'll be speaking about this next week, to be that next generation innovation platform for them. Now, how do they think about a data lake and scale out data for the analytics of all those new uh, devices that they want to connect? And how do they think about generating APIs to bring that user experience? And they'll be talking about how important Cloud Foundry is to them as their next generation IT platform, getting away from their traditional IT. Uh, Monsanto is another company south of here in St. Louis. Uh, that is trying to bring together that big data meets user experience applications as well. They want to give farmers predictive help in how they plant their fields and how they harvest their crops in that same way. And they're using Cloud Foundry and talking about it. CoreLogix is another one that's using this similar pattern with how people apply for leases and mortgages online, and then they have data analytics wrapped up in the back end. So this pattern is not really just Netflix or Nest anymore. It's really coming to the enterprise, and it's one of the most exciting conversations a CIO wants to have. So I'll close out with a little bit of a, a deeper look at, OK, so what do you really get in this platform? What, what happens? What changes? Let's talk a bit more literally. So the first thing that changes when you go to use our platforms of service as a developer is that you don't pick which operating system you want, which middleware you want, which other things that you want at the infrastructure as a service layer. You don't configure networks or security settings. You just hand us an application artifact like a WAR file. And that WAR file is automatically put into a running container and started on the platform. By changing the experience from that menu-based selection of things that you want to just handing us an artifact and we run it for you, we change the agility that developers have in working with the infrastructure, and we give them instant provisioning, even up to the load balancing, so they can have a live URL running in 30 seconds on Cloud Foundry. We've been doing a lot of hands-on training events, and it's one of the reasons I was traveling this week, where we just put this in front of enterprise and let them experience that hands-on. And almost universally out of that, over 70% of the audience will come back to us very interested in getting started with us. That's a really profound shift in that user experience of how you deploy and manage applications. Um, but the other parts of this, and I'll get into it, is really around the operational benefits. Because the first conversation is how do developers get access to things faster and deploy faster. But really, the whole supply chain will grind to a halt if it's not easier and more risk-free to operate those applications. And the benefit of doing a modern application architecture is a lot more of that front end is stateless. And so our system can automatically health manage stateless applications and provide them this dynamic routing tier to instantly bring them online. Um, we call that our four layers of high, ability, high availability. I think it's one of the most important features of Cloud Foundry. So the application first is separated into availability zones. So when you do a deployment, you might have two vSphere clusters, and it'll be half and half, or two Amazon availability zones, if you like. Um, so 50% of the infrastructure is running on either side, and the application is spread across those. That means if you lose data center one or half of the power rack of data center one, Cloud Foundry just keeps rolling for you. That's part of this ethos in the modern web of zero downtime. You just never go down. The APIs never go down. And that's built into the architecture and really gets operations and data center teams excited that they can have an out-of-the-box experience of this multiple availability zones for their developers with no configuration. As soon as you deploy an application to Cloud Foundry, it's automatically wired to two availability zones. The other layers of high availability are in there around health management. So if an application fails because of a memory leak, it's automatically started within three seconds on the platform. 
Um, there's other things that will resurrect the virtual machine. And we even watch every single process that we expect to be running in the cluster and we'll bring it, that process back up, even if the virtual machine is healthy. So we've really built a system of a Google type where you can have one administrator managing tens of thousands of applications and really change the economics of how you then operate the applications that you've written. We're bringing application performance management native to the platform. So if you want to understand the latency or performance of that app after it's been deployed in a very simple fashion, you automatically get that in the heads-up display. And then attached to those metrics, we have auto-scaling and scheduling. So that if you say, hey, we know that this app every morning at 9 a.m. gets really busy and we need to turn it off or scale it down at 1 p.m., you can automatically set that right in the same platform as a service. Secondarily, though, the thing to keep in mind is that a platform as a service is not just about applications. And I think the first generation of platforms as a service you might have heard about might have been two application only. And so we've really worked as part of Pivotal, which is a company focused on both big data and applications, um, to bring Hadoop as a service to Cloud Foundry. And as a proof point that we're no slacker compared to Amazon, uh, we recently posted on the Amazon blog and on the Google blog the highlight of just how fast Cloud Foundry is at creating data clusters and managing them. And we're twice as fast as Amazon's native service, EMR, at creating clusters. The other thing that's really nice is because of our advanced health management, we actually can tell you the precise moment that that cluster is ready for you. Now that seems like a trivial thing, but it highlights the difference between what we call a declarative approach, and this is getting a bit wonky technical, a declarative approach to automation versus imperative. Declarative means that you just say, hey, I want this, tell me when it's ready. Imperative means that you kick off a series of commands and you hope that they finish. The Amazon service just kicks off AMIs and they start up. So you have to keep logging back in and say, hey, is that cluster ready? Is that cluster ready? Because it's not really doing that ask of health management on it. With this, you know the precise moment in three minutes when your cluster is ready to use. I've had some great conversations this week about how people can start to use this elastic Hadoop to give their developers access to doing new big data applications or doing you know, intermittent uh, map reuse kind of approach. So when you bring it together, you know, Pivotal CF, our enterprise product, um, fastens you know, four key pillars. The first is you keep your developers happy. And you keep your developers happy by a revolutionary new experience of how they deploy applications and bind the services on that platform to service. That's called CF Push. So that's our uh, command line interface for deploying an application or using it in a Spring Tool Suite to drag and drop it. All you do is type CF Push, then you give your application file and away it goes. That's a revolution in terms of how they use the platform. And developer productivity is really baked into that. Gets developers very excited. The second pillar is you've got to keep your operations and your IT teams really excited about this platform. And that's some of the features I talked about and the operational benefits. And you know, I just went through these. Uh, but the idea that when you deploy an application, it should be ready to operate. And I'll highlight another one here that I didn't mention before. As soon as you deploy an application to Cloud Foundry, it's automatically wired to have streaming logs coming out of the routing tier, the API tier, the application standard error and standard out, as well as all the events that happen in the application. All of those logs are immediately available at scale of one or a thousand, streaming out into something like Logstash or Splunk, whatever you'd like to use. And this is the idea that there's no secondary thing that the, develop, the operator has to do after the platform is stood up in order to start operating applications. Things are there out of the box for them to have a delightful experience. You also want to keep your CTO happy. And he's going to want to use, he or she is going to want to use uh, new technologies and these new NoSQL data services, these new ways of doing analytics. So Cloud Foundry, as I mentioned before with Hadoop, includes these next generation NoSQL services and stands them up for you automatically very rapidly, health manages them, um, and binds them into applications, uh, which I didn't go too deep on today, but I could in a technical session if anyone wants to follow up, I'd be happy to talk a bit more about that. But this will really keep your architecture and CTO teams happy because all the new toys that they've heard about are going to be available natively on Cloud Foundry, and that's a great way to get started. Additionally, we also have purchased a company called Extreme Labs, which built applications in mobile for great brands like the NFL and others, and they've built a series of mobile backend services to integrate into your applications that are natively available in Pivotal CF. The final thing, though, is you also want to keep your CFO happy. 
And a lot of uh, CIOs and CFOs today are trying to plan what their next series of investments will be in different clouds and different data centers. By betting on Cloud Foundry and Pivotal CF, you can deploy and manage this platform in exactly the same fashion on any infrastructure of your choice so that you don't have to decide all Amazon or all data center or all Google today. You can really parlay and manage these things in a dynamic fashion. So by keeping these four key constituents happy and aligning our architecture um, with this next generation design pattern, we've really become kind of a quick hit product in the enterprise. So summary for me is, is that really enterprises are responding to disruptive change and they're starting to use this platform as a service approach. You can see that in the momentum of the Cloud Foundry Foundation, the vendors and the early mover customers that have gotten involved. So that change is happening and everyone should know about it. Uh, it's important for everyone to think about what's our third platform architecture plan? How are we gonna do Hadoop as a service? How are we gonna do scale out Java applications in a new way? What's our answer to that? Are we thinking about our tool set in a modern and effective way? And finally, when you think about maybe it's time to use Amazon Web Services, understand that Cloud Foundry now gives you the multi-cloud choice so you don't have to make a long-term bet there. You can use that tactically if you like, and you don't have to be locked into their proprietary services, et cetera. So that's a quick preview um, of the things that are going on right now in the Cloud Foundry universe, and I'd be happy to open up um, if there's any questions and, and go from there.